The world's in your hands. Yours for the shaping. If you cannot even withstand some ridicule, some social fears, then how can you own the benefit of all? You can't. Gotta be willing to stand out from the crowd. Not in an egotistical way. That's not the intention. It's not the intention to stand out from the crowd, just to stand out from the crowd. It's just that that's what happens when you stay true in something that is next level of a society that a society is aspiring to, but it's not been able to fully integrate that yet. And so it will reject it. Can you face rejection? Can you be okay with it? I know it's not always easy, but can you do your best? Can you up your efforts in that department? And if you do, you will greatly serve the world. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back. So, why are you here in NLS? Oh no, not that question again. I have to look at my motivations, and intentions. I thought I could just sit here and consume spiritual teachings on a weekly basis. it's always good to ask yourself that question I still from time to time ask myself why I do what I do even though it's mostly always clear in the same frequency well I mean there's lots of different expressions but there's the same core frequency that I've learned to line up to so often throughout my life and sacrifice things for and become one with that it's now sort of just my automatic context but nevertheless, sometimes I still ask myself that question and it almost always still has a refining effect. It still has a purifying effect on some level. So I recommend you ask yourself this often. Why am I here? Why do I do what I do? And not to deconstruct it to death until there's like, well, I don't know. Why should I do anything? That's not the intention of that question. The intention is to realign you to prioritize, become a prioritist. One of the biggest, biggest um, illnesses in our society is not having our priorities clear, just because it uh, detriments our well-being and it limits our positive effect on the world. Very important to have your priorities clear, at least energetically. Doesn't mean you can never procrastinate. Doesn't mean you cannot have ups and downs. Doesn't mean that sometimes you don't want to get out of bed right away. You know, you don't have to be one of those uh, overly productive people that fight their way into success. But what you do want to do, in my opinion, and this is my program, so I'll give you my opinion, I would recommend that energetically in your heart in your knowingness in your awareness you are clear on who you are and where you want to go and now even within that you're going to have a couple of weeks sometimes where that's not so clear and that's part of the getting clearer is not always being very clear if you were always kind of clear then you were never going to be that much clearer but if you have the contrast of sometimes it's just kind of 
feeling like you're living underneath a cloud cover for a few weeks, that's quite okay, and it can be quite useful in the end. Um, lots of lessons can be learned. Your intentionality, your motivation, your inspiration can be sharpened through that contrast because we have a tolerance for being out of alignment. But at some point, that tolerance kind of runs out, right? And when it runs out, we usually have this moment of, what the fuck is going on? I haven't felt like quite myself in like weeks now. And suddenly we take notice if it reaches a certain threshold and we kind of like either kick ourselves lovingly in the butt for a bit or we just get super clear on what we do want. Like if you know what you don't want, if you're aware of the fact that you're on a trajectory that's not 100% who you are, then at some point after enough signals, after enough catalyst, after enough frustration, you're going to be determining that what you prefer now is the clarity of being who you are. So your less clear periods are helping you get clearer, sometimes by a quantum degree, than you were before. But on the whole, you want to prioritize being clear on who you are and why you're here and why you do what you do. Would you agree that that is important? Because it sets the context for everything in your day-to-day -day life, no? It sets the base frequency, the base line vibration, the background vibration is set in that way. Now within that, there can be lots of fluctuations and lots of lessons and some topics that you challenge yourself with and other topics that just kind of go smooth and they fly past you like they're not even topics. They're just kind of seamlessly integrated with the flow of your life. Other topics stand out a little bit more and they, they make you think, they make you struggle. You've got some resistance. You've got some unresolved or unfulfilled desires around them. But as long as you know who you are and why you're here, now the container for all those contents, all those fun challenges, that journey, at least the container is clear. Because if the container is not clear, then you are out of alignment. Whereas if you, if the container is clear, if the context is clear, the context of your life, the context intentionality of your life is prioritized, then you are in alignment. And then you're not in alignment on certain topics in your life. But if you are not in alignment, baseline, context, if you're not clear on why you're here and the value of your incarnation, then it becomes much harder to take on these topics with any kind of clarity. And then they just kind of ping pong us around. Right? You recognize what I'm saying? Does it make sense? In your own direct experience, right? Okay. So a symbol for that is uh, No Limit Society. Why are you here? Do you even know? Now, you can be clear without knowing why conceptually. That's possible. But typically, if you are clear, clear vibrationally, you are able to put it into some kind of a word or symbol. It doesn't mean you have to, but it can be helpful. And if you are clear vibrationally on why you're here, meaning that you actually acted on resonance, you actually acted on a calling that you had and that calls you forth, then describing it wouldn't be too hard, usually. So let's see some hand raises. Why are you here? Curious, who am I dealing with here? Because who you are to me is why you are here. That's who you are. So if I want to know who I'm dealing with, I need to know why you're here. Travis? And um, just be radically... Honest, just whatever it is for you, whatever your current description is, don't try to give an answer that you think I'll like, because then I probably won't like it, even if it's the right one. All right, Travis, go ahead. The main frequency has to do with people being free. And I like the concept of a social memory complex. <clears throat> so like people coming together and connecting and getting more sensitive with each other. Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you. Sabine? Okay. 
um, ever since I heard of the path of the Bodhisattva, um, my goal in this lifetime is um, enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And that's why I'm here, to get the tools. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. All right, a couple more people. Katrin? Oh, I haven't muted myself. Yes, that's the first step. <laughs> I want a piece. Yeah, unblock that throat chakra. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I want peace on this planet. Nice. Me too. Yeah. I'm already certain of it. Um, but uh, the best way to Very do powerful. it, I think I have to buy large amounts of acres of land and uh, grow crops and give everybody free food. And Wonderful. then... Um, do like kind of a network of uh, a course that people learn how to find their calling. Wonderful. Thank you. Beautiful. Marcel? Um, curiosity and longing to go deeper. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you. Lawrence? Because it's fun. Because it's fun? Cool. Because it's fun. And, um, and to step oh. up as well. Okay, nice. <laughs> Jonathan? Uh, hi. <clears throat> hi. So, uh, it's kind of your fault. Um, nice. I don't know. There's something about you, <laughs> something about you that I kept coming back, but then you gave the global enlightenment re course mm -hmm. and all of a sudden enlightenment went from something for other people to holy shit, mm -hmm. this is possible. <laughs> and sometime after that, I don't know, this just, it just happened. What can I say? It just seems to be, the place, the only place for me to be. And to the best way to be in the world is to be the best you can be. And that has the greatest impact. So here I am, loving it. Very sweet, thank you. You're welcome. Elizabeth? Do you have Carpool Tunnel yet, uh, Mesh? <laughs> or Thomas? <laughs> Thomas keeps shifting between like speaker view and gallery view and muting and unmuting and do 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 do. Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, I cannot be in another place like this one. It was like nine months ago, I thought being grilled by my gremlin so long this is my last boat and um this man continues the arc. yes and it's it's like you are cooking something different i'm grilled by my gremlin and you're cooking something different so <laughs> the shakti the transmission is of such a form that it it keeps shifting and shifting and shifting where I used to be processing my head off you know this is shifting this is different and this morning I thought is there a next now is there a next now what kind of threshold is this and I don't care to be disoriented disorientated by this question because I gave up all the linear approach and here I am, you know, and I cried and I thought, what's the next step then? To give, to give, it's, it has been there all my life and it's, it's so vivid and my body is like too small. And I, <laughs> I found that I can enlarge and enlarge my body, you know, and then all of a sudden it's all there. It's all yeah. in. 
God. And it brings me to such a, a joy, you know, I, this is maybe not an answer, but it's a sharing. And uh, it brings me to tears because I don't know what to do next, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And this is a spiritual luxury problem that you're having. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so filled with joy. I don't know what to do next. <laughs> yeah, I Beautiful. mean, it's all about serving yeah and i know i i choose many many ways to to experience the spiritual qualities of my life or well i was just um somewhere being of be, wanting to be a fool like wanting to be in a service but also wanted to be a um um, one of these saints, you know, a mad man saint, a mad woman saint, and now I found I can be. And uh, well, who who wants to have this? Other people who like to have peace, you know. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. I love it. Oh, wow, we've got lots of hands up. I like it. Barbara? You hear me now? You hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, what a nice I, dress in the background. Look at that. A dress? Oh, yes. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so I joined. Initially, I joined because I. Um, your teachings just really, really spoke to me, um, and I, I felt the calling uh, big time, and I felt the potential, and um, and I was proven right. Um, I really make made a large shift, um, and what I also really, really love um, when being here is the community. This community, this um, super loving community, the energy field. Um, and um, this is something I just would so love to create for good for everyone. Um, it gives me a lot of bliss and happiness, and I really, really enjoy it so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Hey, Bettina. Hey. Uh why am I well, why am I here on this planet? I think it has to do with uh, open others to love and to yeah the deeper layer of themselves. And of course, self-realization uh, for me to realize who I really am. And why I'm in NLS is because I read a book of Osho. And in the end, he said, find your guru. And um, I was a bit against gurus, so it really was like, no, fuck that. I'm not going to find my guru. I do everything myself. But every time I hear you speak for years, it just resonates. So my mind goes like, yeah, this guy smoking cigars. Well, I smoke cigars now also, but um, yeah, it resonates. It's just it, every time it's like, <laughs> so I, yeah, that's why I'm here still. <laughs> And it's amazing. It brought me so much. Thank you. Thank you. And good to hear I'm a good influence on you. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Sweet, man. Thank you. Carlos? How are you doing, Tommy? It's going well. <laughs> Hello, Ventinho. Hey. Hello. Hey. So I'm here to embody the fullness of truth. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, a taste of it. And um, so I'm convinced that it's possible, as you say. And um, I cannot lose this opportunity of this lifetime to be fully alive to be uh, an embodiment of that I know through. Yep, 
I feel you. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you. Thomas? Hello. Um, to be with others of the same heart. Great. Thank you. Maria? I'm here to embody the power of pure being and of shine what? my light of pure being. Pure being? Okay, sweet. Pure being and yeah. shine my light. Good. Good. Thank you. Judith? Um, I'm here to find my way back home to source. Perfect. Thank you. Allison? Hi. <laughs> um, you and your mission, our mission resonates so deeply with me. I'm here to... Um, help people manifest their magnificence. And I know that I have to do that first, um, but I am absolutely certain that we are, the truth of who we are is magnificent and that I'm here to help people realize that and live that and manifest the heaven on earth. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right, last two, Sharuk. Me? You bet. Uh, well, I'm here because I want to be as empty as possible and transparent to the love and light of the creator, which is me, so I can be in the most service to the collective throughout this transition and manifest all here. What was the last part? Manifest Shambhala. Sweet. Beautiful. Thank you. Rosa, last one. Hi, Ben. Hey. Hey. I am here um, to be an open channel for the love of God and to support the mission. Wonderful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Sweet, my friends. Very sweet. That's good. That all aligns with the intention of No Limit Society. No Limit Society, essentially, for me, has two, two aspects to its intention. Or you could say two parallel intentions that very much so complement each other and are intertwined. One is the work we're doing as individuals on ourselves here, the rapid clarification process, the purification process, the returning to source, to home, self-realization, um, purifying where we're coming from, just through knowing ourselves and accepting ourselves and becoming the creator. So it's a fast course into more of the truth of who we are as individuals. And the, the other main aspect or intention behind No Limit Society is, well, to create a No Limit Society, right? So the work we do with ourselves, on ourselves as individuals, turn us into free agents in service of the ignition of global awakening. And so that's, you could say that's its main intention, but the means to do that is a lot of the individuated clarification work that we're doing. 
it's really powerful to be with the group of people that we're with now, some of which has come, have come, have been sort of organically selected by life itself through No Limits Mentorship Program and the No Limits Society. Because if my team has gone through lots of different iterations over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Sometimes I lose track of time. Um, and it's, it's just a world of difference. No offense to my former team iterations. And uh, I was at the source of that. But nevertheless, the contrast is pretty it's noticeable, it's significant. And it's really nice to be with a group of people now where I actually trust them with my life. And, and there's just a feeling that's hard to describe when people are not told what to do by any outside authority. There's no government or organization or pre-existing university that taught us or told us what the mission is. It's really from the inside out, from our own connection, we get aligned and we know we're here for the same general mission. And then for every individual in that crew, in that team, in that collective, just to kind of harken a little bit on the social memory complex that Travis brought up, to get aligned behind a mission that is intrinsically downloaded and motivated. It's just given by source, by spirit, by higher up, so to speak, deeper within. And for multiple individuals to be able to tap into that within themselves, not just because I said so, that might be the initial symbol where they recognize like, hey, whatever this guy is talking about or from, something in me resonates. I'm interested. For a lot of people, that is kind of how it started. But then over time, for them to connect to the same source and the same vision in their own unique blueprint and to be plugged into that, and then to see that that power and that motivation and that devotion comes from that same source that drives me. It's hard to describe, but it's, a, it's an incredible experience that is a bit of a precursor for the collective to come. And um, a No Limit Society basically, essentially, also trains you, or at least that is its intention, and especially the training weeks, to be ready for that. Whether or not you're physically part of our particular team doesn't matter so much, but it's... Um, it's a vibrational readiness. It's a spiritual readiness that is called forth here. That's an opportunity for you to step into if it resonates, of course. And um, yeah, that's kind of what the training weeks are designed to do, to create. But it's a really cool feeling to, um, to just be able to look around and feel that I can trust every person with my life, essentially. That's just one way to translate that feeling of trust, right? I mean, there's other ways you can gauge that, but that's um, it's a feeling that I haven't always had in other team iterations. So, and it's getting really close to being absolute in that sense. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm addressing it here, but again, I, I haven't really conveyed it because it's hard to describe. But I guess I just want to say how beautiful it is and how worthwhile it is to do this kind of work and to devote yourself to something greater than just your own physical lives and uh, to be ready to serve, to be ready to be called forth, not by me or anyone in particular, but by that inner mission that I think most of you guys share, at least to some degree. And for some of you, there might be more layers in between, or at least you think, maybe you think, maybe actually, but sometimes you think there are some more layers in between because you don't think too highly of yourself sometimes. Um, and, and for some of you, there are actually some layers that need to be first addressed and kind of healed and some more individual work that needs to be done before you actually do have the readiness or capacity for this kind of... A, unified service to others, but it is definitely possible for all of you. And uh, I, I sense strongly that a lot of you already have that quality very present in your field. But yeah, it's a, it's a very beautiful, harmonious and powerful feeling to be with multiple beings. That you can actually trust, like that actually trust you also. Like that's also a unique feeling that people actually trust you 
you know. Because sometimes people approach me or or think they're excited to like work with me or work with us for all the wrong reasons. And then um, they typically don't withstand the uh, the gates that guard the courtyard, if you will. Or as Anurag says sometimes, the um, gatekeepers to enlightenment are confusion and paradox, both of which I'm quite masterful at these days. And um, and it can't scare people away. So if the intention isn't really aligned with the mission, if it's some kind of an idolized idea about me or it's some kind of idea about what you can get out of it, and some of these intentions are hidden. They're hidden from your own view. You don't always realize that's what's going on. And um, but it's it's such a it's such a rare and beautiful process in our modern westernized atheistic kind of day and age to be to have such an opportunity to kind of test your the purity of your fire. Um, in, in this context of no limit society as an initial step. And then for some of you, um, during retreats or events or in some kind of a team setting over time, organically. And it's such a beautiful opportunity to see what you're made of, you know, it is like going to Navy SEALs training. What it, what that is on a physical mental level, this is on a um, spiritual mental level, I suppose. And as you begin to sort of come through those gateways into the inner courtyards, if you will, I mean, this is just symbolic. I don't mean anything physical by this so much. But as you kind of purify yourself in this fire, then it's you're plugged in. Like you're at some point, there's nothing in the way. Doesn't mean you won't have your processes anymore, but there's just nothing in the way of your heart and your devotion to God and while you're here. And you might have your off days, but again, the context of where you're coming from is just solid. It's reliable. And, um, and it's a cool idea, right? To think that that's what you want, <laughs> but it's not necessarily what people want. It's not, uh, when it comes down to it, it's not always easy to give up what you think you want for that, which you really want. And maybe this isn't what you really want, but in a lot of cases, even where people don't make it through those fires, so to speak, um, and we don't have any kind of weird initiatory processes or anything, I don't want to give that picture. It's a very organic getting closer to the sun type of experience, like how much of the heat of just purity and truth and transparency and true alignment to the mission, where no false intention, where no gremlin agenda can fit in that as you kind of move closer and closer to the fire of the sun, of the mission, of the work, your layers are going to be burned off. And as you know, from prior experience, that's not always a pleasant confrontation with yourself, right? <laughs> so we don't have, for clarity's sake, we don't have any weird initiatory processes like you'd have at fret houses or anything like that. Um, but there is a natural organic, that it just happens, like as you approach this type of work and beings that are very constituted in the mission is your stuff is going to stand out stuff that doesn't stand out to you yet from the comfort of your living room when you're just you and your family and your own gremlin that you're already used to for years when that's faced with a presence some of which you can already get here on the calls you know if you're having a q a here with me there's already some intimidation factor probably some kind of like self-aware um energy that is elevated from your normal state when you're just doing your groceries. So you're already paying more attention. You're already feeling more of the transmission. You're already getting more of that mirror effect. And sometimes it's pleasant for the most part. I like to think it's pleasant for you guys. And sometimes it's a little confronting, maybe a little challenging, but so far everyone here seems to be doing very well with it. But when you get really close to it, those things that can hide easily, even in a Q and A that you're having here with me, they just can't hide. If you really say that you're constituted as the mission and you want to serve and you want to join us and you want to help this this thing, 
well, you better, you know, you better be prepared to, to be true, like to be true all the way true. And um, that's often something we desire and fear at the same time. It is, um, it is a form of, it's, it's an obliteration of the false layers. And the degree to which we're attached to those false layers, literally, quite literally, like holding on to those layers because they give us a sense of identity, a false sense of security and protection, which can be valid in certain phases of your life. But ultimately, it's illusory. We all know that ultimately we are safe, right? But it can appear like you need those layers in order to protect yourself, in order to know who you are, in order to have a sense of self that's solid and reliable and in control. And when those kinds of layers start being brought into the light of the sun, they're going to they're gonna burn off. And if you're still holding on to it, you're going to burn with it. That's the sensation. You're going to like, yeah, you're going to freak out along with the freaking out. <laughs> or you're going to be purged along with that which is being purged because you're holding on to it. So if the gremlin kind of is kicked out of the car just by the natural presence of the energies, it's like you're kind of flying out of the vehicle with it. And uh, this natural ejection process. Because my friends, if we're at all serious, and I mean serious, ironically, in a lighthearted way, because you got to be lighthearted in order to be consistently sincere about this. You just, you're not going to make it long term if you don't have a good sense of inappropriate humor, irreverence, lightheartedness, and playfulness about this whole thing, everything included, your own processes included. If you don't have a sense of playfulness around it all, then you can't be serious consistently. And we are looking for seriousness, but not in a serious kind of way. So sincerity or earnestness is a better word than seriousness. But it's hard to be earnest if you don't have perspective, right? And what is humor except for perspective? Um, so, but what I was going to say is that if we are sincere about this mission, like again, to use the Navy SEALs example, and of course, those are, those are the types of missions that are not the type of mission that we're talking about. So it's purely functional as an analogy only, as a symbol. It doesn't apply directly. It's just an analogy. But if there is a really high profile mission, if you don't have a Navy SEALs team that's trained to actually execute and see that kind of thing through, it never happens. So in a similar way, if we're earnest about this, but the entire spiritual community is discombobulated and, and disorganized and is afraid of their own personal power and tries to still play to the crowd and tries to still blend in and be perceived as sort of a nice, good citizen, um, and it doesn't have the tools, doesn't have the awareness, doesn't have the communal support, doesn't have the backup, doesn't have the crowdsourcedness, doesn't have the unity, doesn't have the awareness, doesn't have the enlightenment, doesn't have the freedom, doesn't have the access to the sense of invincibility and being more than just a human being. Of course, you can have your off days. Navy SEALs have their off days too, as much as anybody else. But it's the training and it's the devotion and the commitment and knowing that you have a team to back you up and that there's some manner of organization behind that intentionality. If that unity is not there, which for the most part, it seems to be lacking in, in the spiritual new age community, then nothing much will be accomplished. Some things will be accomplished, but not as much as is possible. And one could argue necessary. So to bring some unification and strength and reinforcement into well-meaning people that are on a spiritual path and that want to see peace on this planet, I think is a missing component and is something that NLS is also attempting to create. And it doesn't require that many people. It, Navy SEAL teams are very small teams, but they get a lot of stuff done. And the same applies spiritually. If multiple people are connected to source, and these beings are also connected together in full trust. Again, to use the Navy SEALs analogy, if you cannot trust the person next to you, you're dead, right? So it's a, in those situations, it's a physical life or death kind of situation. And 
you got to be able to be completely transparent. And I've heard multiple stories of these people where they actually do clear things up vibrationally also. If something is off or someone has a family problem and it's bothering them and they also sense that it's in the field and it's distracting from the mission. Uh, so they do, you know, also quite a bit of psychological work because it's necessary. You need to be able to clear everything with each other. If I have a problem with you and we're in the same helicopter and we're about to fly into, um, you know, a different country where we're not supposed to be and take out a target, then I need to be able to trust you with my life and vice versa. There needs to be nothing in between us. That's the only way a small team, but then a small team is sufficient because it can be so precise and it, it's so much more powerful and alert and aware and prepared in its awareness of that situation than anything they're going to be encountering, even if there's much greater forces out there. So it's not so much about the numbers, although the numbers would be nice. It would be nice to have a global shift at some point that has a tipping point to it, and we're approaching that. We're doing it haphazardly. We're doing it kind of pell-mell without much structure and unification, but it is happening. But also a quality that No Limit Society can bring is to train individuals. doesn't mean that all have to be part of that team, but nevertheless to receive the training required to constitute yourself in a more courageous way. Um, because again, I, I do think courage, one could even say bravery, is a quality that is largely missing. Not entirely. Of course, it takes courage even to be on the spiritual path. So it's not entirely true. And all beings are perfect and beautiful. So this is not a value judgment on any character or any individual. But if I'm looking at it from a <clears throat> from a mission point of view and a collective point of view and a vibrational probabilities point of view and other points of view, <laughs> then I could say, again, not as a judgment, but as definitely as an observation, that there is some courage lacking, that there is a meekness, there is a weakness in the spiritual community. Um, now, this is different than say, the surrender of the feminine, the surrender quality in the feminine. So just to be super clear on this, when I say weak, I don't mean, um, I don't mean you should be fighting anything. When I say weak, I mean, I don't mean that you cannot completely relax and surrender to source and to God. That's not weak at all. That requires great courage, actually, if you do it earnestly and all the way. Surrender is one of the bravest things you could ever do, to surrender to God, to surrender to a mission, to surrender to your own higher self, your intention for being here, to let go of the gremlin that you believe keeps you safe. That's that's the courage that we need. But a lot of spirituality kind of talks around it and a lot of people kind of walk around it, like beat around the bush with it. And then when it comes to unifying as a collective, to standing, to standing strong and to not being afraid to be out there in that frequency, to be seen, to be heard, to make claims, to make statements, to address this collective from a new vantage point to offer it something new. If we shy away from that, then who are we doing it for? You know, is, is our spiritual journey just a Netflix show that we watch or is it our day-to-day -day lives? Is it our day-to-day -day integration with our families, with our communities and um, the work that we do? How fearless are we in, in claiming that we believe what we believe or that we are who we are rather it's not about a fight for beliefs because that's been so detrimental to this planet already so it's not about my belief is better than your belief but to stand tall to stand fearlessly unwavering in what you do know is true for you internally it doesn't have to be belief it can just be a feeling it can be a knowing it can be your calling but to not shy away from shining that out there is something i still find hard um to come by even to critique a little bit further without judgment, but nevertheless with helpful observation, in my opinion. In those who represent those communities, I find that most of them still placate and cater to what is expected by society. They're still staying very safe inside of pre 
prescribed conditions and paradigms and what is socially acceptable and what isn't and so forth. So there's a, there's a very heavy sort of moral obligation that pervades humanity in all fields of life. But especially as soon as we start, step into the public life, and especially with this whole rampant, ridiculous cancel culture vibe that's going on, where everything I feel is somebody else's fault out there because they said this. And then to see so many representatives of spiritual communities and spiritual trends and teachings play it so incredibly safe. Now, for some, there there's a wisdom behind that, but for others, it's just fear-based. And then if I look at it from a mission point of view, not just from, hey, we're individuals and we're here to realize God, but if I look at it from a more active point of view, um, then I say that's not the most helpful route to take. And what we need right now is more people to stand up and shine their light in a very authentic way, in a non-combative way, but also in a non-backing down, non-concessional way. To not make concessions on what you know is true in the face of critique or ridicule or being ostracized is what we need. We need to be able to stand up for the world that we claim we want and not just sit on our couches, consume spiritual content and say, I want peace on earth. But then the moment you get ridiculed or the moment you have to step up and take an opportunity, you shy away. Or the moment you are about to publicly be associated with me, and there's articles about me out there, supposedly about me, then to no longer want that association because you might be ridiculed and those kinds of things are very understandable human traits. But if throughout history, right, any kind of revolution that kind of had a lot of potential, but it failed, any kind of evolution, social evolution that had a lot of momentum, but then failed, for the most part, it's been because there's only been one person that was spearheading that evolution. And there weren't enough people constituted in that same vibration and fearlessness. And it's it's easy to chop out, to chop off one head that's sticking out above the crowd. But if the entire crowd's sticking out their heads, then nobody is. Then what are you going to cut off, you know? What are you going to undermine? So there's also a certain quality of courage and strength, and that's what I kind of mean with the Navy SEALs analogy, or sort of sometimes I've used sort of the Vikings concept. And again, I'm not at all promoting warfare. I'm not at all, at all promoting violence in any form. So that's not it. That's definitely not it. But I am talking about the courage and the bravery that those kinds of archetypes demonstrate for us as an inspiring symbol to aspire to. But if we can apply that to love, if we can be courageous in standing true and representing God's love and what we know works and how beneficial this is for the world, then we, then we become more than just people that consume spiritual content and claim they want peace on earth but are still very much afraid of being ridiculed or being ostracized. And it's just, just there's a hypocrisy in there that I think we can all feel within ourselves. And, uh, and it's okay. We're human in that regard. But it's not the end of the line. You have time. You have the ability to transcend that. You have the ability to work with that and have breakthroughs in that and become more fearless and courageous. And just think about how good that would feel for you to be able to truly stand in your light, no matter the opposition, no matter the critique, and to represent something. And imagine if, you know, a couple million people around the world start doing that. And they are beginning to do that. It's just, again, it's very discombobulated and separated. But it is all coming to a single point in the end. But we can accelerate that ignition. We can ignite that powder that's already there it's already inflammable the desire already exists in the collective we're just igniting it we're not doing it we're igniting it people already want this but if not enough people stand up for that reality and stand in that reality and live in the end of that reality that vibration and stay true to it no matter what's coming their way then it's just you know we postpone it we postpone it we postpone it and this has an actual negative effect on the world who are you why are you here What's the vibration you're constituted in? Do you understand the word constitution?
This is not about any kind of rigidness, by the way. It's not about a ideology that you have to fight for. I don't like activism. There's so much wrong with activism, vibrationally, so much out of alignment about most forms of activism. So this is not a call to arms in that sense. This is not a call to activism. This is not about ideologies. It's not about spreading the great word or spreading my name or a particular teaching. It's not about that. It's about you as an individual knowing why you're here and constituting yourself in that intention, not just saying it, but being it. And sometimes, just as in this call I'm attempting to do, challenge yourself a little bit and see, stretch that using your imagination. How fearless am I in my calling? How true am I living it? How courageous am I standing in that truth? Not against anything, just standing in your truth and not backing down from it, not making concessions on it. You don't have to fight in order to not make concessions. In fact, that's a flawed idea, and that's the flawed premise behind most forms of activism, is that in order to stay true in my reality, I need to change their reality. That's the flawed premise of activism. I need to fix what's out there in order to live in the truth of my reality. Because something out there is opposing my reality. Now, to some degree, sometimes there is a truth to that also. But on the whole, energetically, for the most part, it's a misaligned vibration. And it undermines the effectiveness of any kind of activistic intention. So what I'm suggesting people do is find their truth as clear as they can, work on clarifying it every single day, becoming more purely constituted in it, meaning there's less and less and less stuff within your mind, body, and spirit that contradicts your calling. It's that simple. If you find an element of your life that's out of alignment with why you're here, work on bringing it into alignment or letting it go. So you become streamlined to the point where you can dive through the eye of the needle without any fiber sticking out, postponing your dive through so that you are true. You are a true embodiment of what you say you are here to be and express. And if each can do that individually, and then for some it will be relevant, for a lot of you it will be relevant to form communities and groups, and you have one here, of course, where you can share a sense of togetherness in that, which can further reinforce your courage in it. Because the more people, you know this from experiences, if uh, your school teacher asks you, you know, to stand up if you vote for this. It's always tricky to be the first person to stand up, but when five people have stand, are standing up and you're passionate enough about that same topic, it's so much easier to stand up. And nothing wrong with that, taking the easier route. But if everybody would be willing to be the first person to stand up, then how much potency would that have? Not to fight against anything, but just to stand up and stand strong and what you know is true, and not back down. Let other people's confusions or interpretations or opinions, let them fall off of you, let them bounce off of you. Let them not bring you down back to the level that exists in the world that you want to transmute into a more peaceful one, to a more loving one. So this is a revolution. It's just um, a vibrational one. It's not one that's fought with physical equipment, but it is nevertheless a revolution. It is standing up for a different planet and owning that vibration. And ours just happened to be peace and love and happiness. So it's uh, an unity. But nevertheless, in order to bring that about, we need to be constituted in that vibration. We need to be more fearless in that frequency. And spirituality at large seems to just kind of dismiss this as uh, egotistical or ambitious or... Um, but really, I think most of these justifications are fear-based. They're what they're taught by society around them, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what's ego, what's not ego, and so forth. Remember, every time you're serving your own fears, you are not responding to the call of billions. Okay? 
You're choosing self, the comfort of self, over the calling, the need of billions that don't have the spiritual privilege that you have, that don't have the position, the clarity that you have. And make no mistake, you might look up to me in some cases and and put me on a bigger picture, or a higher pedestal than yourself, but make no mistake, you are some of the clearest people on this planet. Do you understand that? You are some of the most privileged, spiritually speaking, people on this planet. And it's easy to always think lowly of yourself, but I want you to understand how much you already have to offer this world. Even if you can't speak as I speak right now, that has nothing to do with your own ability to shine your light. And that's what's needed now more than ever. And so if it's just lip service, and we're just here to consume, then at some point, the law of responsibility is going to kick our butts. Because we say, and we know better, but we don't act better. I'll explain the law of responsibility a little bit. It's a helpful law to be aware of. <clears throat> I was first made aware of this law through the law of one material. And I'm going to translate it in my own words, in my own terms, make it a little bit more accessible. But essentially, the law of responsibility is a dynamic law, meaning it can either be active or inactive as it applies to an individual. So take yourself. The law of responsibility right now in your life, as it applies to your experience of life, is active on certain topics and it's inactive on other topics. When is it activated? It is activated when you know better, but you're not yet lining your constitution and your actions and your deeds and your words and your alignment. You're not aligning that yet to what you know is, quote unquote, better, is more aligned, is truer for you. Now, the bigger the gap between what you know is true to put it in very human terms, I don't like these terms, but just to make it a little bit more clear, when you know you should be doing something, but you don't, the bigger that gap, the more you know you should be doing it, sometimes we call this procrastination, right? Or avoidance, but you're not lining up with that, the bigger the catalyst that the law of responsibility will bring into your life. If you don't know any better, the law of responsibility is not active for you on that topic because it would be unreasonable. It's highly intelligent. It's tailored exactly to what you're conscious of being and what you're conscious of knowing and what you're conscious of what's possible. This is the risk in expanding your consciousness. Because when you do, you start realizing what is possible, what is more appropriate, what is more true, what is more aligned. And now that you know these things, law of responsibility kicks in and it's going to kick your butt if you don't do it for yourself. <laughs> Such a beautiful universe, such a beautiful unified self. So if you don't lovingly kick your own butt sometimes and be like, hey, stop procrastinating on not aligning my actions with what I know is true for me, what I know is true for the mission, what I know is true from source. If, I, if you don't line that up yourself, you're inviting the catalyst, which often translates in terms of suffering or non-preferable occurrences. <laughs> and these, uh, these begin intuitively, subtly, mentally, emotionally. And then if you still avoid them for long enough and you know better, but you don't act better, and you're getting these emotional signals and you're getting these mental signals and you're getting this intuitive hit and you're getting these opportunities you could be taking, but you don't out of fear, but you know better, then at some point it's going to turn into physical catalyst. It's going to really challenge you. It's going to stop you in your tracks. It's going to pause what you're doing. That's a lot of responsibility. Some call it karma. But it kicks in the moment you're, you know better. <laughs> There's some leeway. There is a lot of grace in there. But it will begin to knock on your door. And if you don't respond to the knocks, it will, you know, it will come in with a little bit more force at some point. So this is also why I believe a lot of spiritual quote-unquote revolutions that kind of begin to take shape 
the hippie movement being, in a sense, one example of it. Albeit a somewhat immature version of it, but nevertheless, it is an aspect, it is, it is one expression of this evolution. They were not constituted enough as a whole to live true to what they knew was true. There was still too much activism going on, too much shouting at the outside world, and not really lining their lives up consistently with that inner truth. And so it will die off. It will be undermined. It will not find root. And it's the same now, and it's even more important now, and we have the tools now, we have a more mature awareness now, but we do need to be uh, courageous. And um, I'm still a little appalled that I don't see that happen so much out there by those who are supposed to represent the new earth. And by some, I do see that, but there's a lot that are still just kind of playing the social game, playing it very safe. And that makes me question the integrity of their awakening, because awakening brings about a fearlessness and a devotion that is one pointed. And if it still caters to the society's expectations, it's a human trait, it's totally fine. I'm not judging that as a presence, as something to deal with. But if that continues to hold back the message, that like who's going to change this? Uh, who's going to transmute this planet? And yes, we're all doing it individually. Yes, we kind of upgrade here and there. and like, But it's so disconnected. So don't look outside yourself. Don't look for higher teachings or teachers or examples out there. You yourself are the creme de la creme. It's up to you. You are the Navy SEALs team. Now, we're about to get some support from um, out there, but it's still going to take a few years before that fully integrates. And it's not going to be able to fully integrate if we're not ready either. Those are just some of my thoughts on this leisurely Wednesday post-weekend retreat energy. I hope it's all lending with a sense of joy and playfulness as it's intended. But seriously, the world's in your hands. Yours for the shaping. If you cannot even withstand some ridicule, some social fears, then how can you own the benefit of all? You can't. Got to be willing to stand out from the crowd. Not in an egotistical way. That's not the intention. It's not the intention to stand out from the crowd, just to stand out from the crowd. It's just that that's what happens when you stay true in something that is next level of a society that a society is aspiring to, but it's not been able to fully integrate that yet. And so it will reject it. Can you face rejection? Can you be okay with it? I know it's not always easy, but can you do your best? Can you up your efforts in that department? And if you do, you will greatly serve the world and future generations and your own kids. And every time you back down, no, you're okay. Sometimes it's okay to back down, to regroup, to recharge. That's very necessary. But on the whole, if you avoid it, if you avoid your calling, if you avoid your destiny, if you avoid being who you are here to shine and be, because someone says something the moment you raise your vibration, <laughs> They don't like it, you know. The moment you raise your vibration, like, oh, mm -hmm. he's weird, she's weird. Oh, what about this? Oh. Um, 
if you can't even face that on the whole, okay, again, it's fine to recharge, it's fine to retreat, it's fine to be isolated for certain periods of time to get clear on who you are and what you want to do. But on the whole, if you are afraid to be true to who you are, to what you know, then you are choosing self at some point when you know better, when that gap's too big, you know better, but you're not acting on it, at some point it becomes service to self. It becomes negative. Because every time you make that choice to back down, you are saying no, you're rejecting the call of billions. And the irony is, my friends, that it is those that ridicule you and critique you and reject you that are calling for what they are ridiculing you for. So if you accept their negative offerings, you are also accepting not being of service to them. Does that make sense? And I wouldn't be true to my own self and my own intentions if NLS was just another Netflix program. Are there any reactions to this that you guys would like to share? Allison? Yeah, I feel like you're speaking directly to me. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. Um, I have felt for a while now, like um, there is a group of beings who are sort of seem to be in control of the planet and they seem to have a plan they seem to have resources um and that the consciousness the the you know the spiritual communities are not we don't have that it's it it feels like we don't have unity we don't have a vision that's a unified vision um for the new earth we I have, I have wondered how do we do this? Like, um, and it feels like exactly what you're speaking to. And I feel a little bit of a sense of urgency. And I also have great faith that everything's happening in perfect timing, but I would love to hear you speak. I don't know if my question is clear, but I, I'm, I, I'm curious how you're holding the this way the world looks right now <laughs> and i mean i know it's possible for us to create the new earth and i know i'm here for that and i i definitely feel like we need a unified vision and a plan and um so yeah i guess i just want to hear you speak to that a little bit more in the context of the world today and what we're seeing That's a good balance to have a sense of urgency, though not for that to reach into the realm of stress and fear, but a healthy sense of paying attention and doing our best. Blend it with a great sense of faith that it's all working out. Now, the most powerful way to do this is to live in your destiny ful fulfilled state. As I don't know if you saw the weekend retreat, did you? Yes. Sweet. So then you know what I'm talking about. To be in the destiny fulfilled state is one of the most powerful things you can do because it will inspire you to certain actions it will inspire you to shine and it will inspire you to shift into those frequencies that others will join you in that naturally create and bring about the world that wants to come through so it's more like the planet is going to come through like-minded souls such as yourself and it's, it's, in a sense, very effortlessly, going to very effortlessly going to manifest through such consciousnesses. So it's important to, to a degree, be educated or have some sense of what's going on out there. But for the most part, I would say more than, more than 90% of your energy 
should be invested in seeing the world the way you want to see it and living true according to that. But then when your world, your envisioned world and vibration meets with the quote unquote world out there, develop greater courage and fearlessness to stay true to the vision that you know, the planet that you know. But most important is that you feel it as real, that you feel it as already existent and as already happening. And not to make any concessions on that, not to lose your faith in that, and let your actions come from your faith in that new planet. Does this answer all your questions around this, or is there a detail that I missed? Yes, we will unmute you. Or you're muted. Somehow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, yes, it does. Um, sorry, somebody's doing dishes in the background. Um, How nice. When are they available? It is. <laughs> she doesn't speak English, so I can't tell her to stop. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that answers my question. I think one of the things I'm going to go back and listen to what you said, because I felt a potency when you said there was something about the faith that when you said that it's going to come through us effortlessly, yes, that really landed like that's where my faith needs to be instead of some kind of out there somewhere. There's, there's something about that that really felt different than what I've been doing. Yes. And what happens more and more is that as you're constituted in that frequency and you have faith in that reality, it doesn't mean there's no action. It doesn't mean there's no contact with the matrix world as it is. Um, so it's not a complacency to have faith does not mean to be concessional or complacent. But what happens is that more and more about you around you, that planet is going to manifest already. And so what I'm saying, my day to day experience, in this sort of physical space time reality with the team and so forth, it is already very, very much like that reality, like that new planet. So if I were to not see anything on social media or on the news or hear about anything, as far as I'm concerned, just for my physical observation, we're already living a fourth density life. If more and more and more and more people live that way, at some point there is no portion of planet earth left that's not that way and then we could say in a linear way we have changed the world but it's not really the experience it's more that each of us has shifted their frequency and therefore now effortlessly through us we perceive we manifest but rather we shift into a creation that already exists that is of a different frequency so it's more frequency shift than anything else but if we, if we keep backing down and if we keep being afraid of the people out there, um, if we don't shine, then it's not going to come about fully, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel like there could be a whole nother question in here and it's okay if you don't want to answer it today, but th th I, I also know what to do about it, I think. But, you know, that balance between knowing what's going on and holding my frequency um, I definitely don't pay that much attention to it anymore. Uh, but I have like this little sense that it's going to bite me in the butt. Like, like if I don't know it's what's going on, um, that it's going to creep into my reality somehow. Like there's some idea that hmm. where I lose my authority. Yeah. Like there's something, a feeling like that. So I, don't I would know say, I would say in general, I mean, go off of your individual intuition for sure. But in general, I'd say the opposite is more true. The more you're focused on that reality, the more it will bite you in the butt. The more you're focused on the reality you prefer, the less the other reality will bite you in the butt because it can't reach you if you're in that frequency. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. Yeah, I think my faith, my belief in that, there's just a little wobble in that. Like Perfect. thinking yeah, that great. the world out there is still some, something. Yeah. That, like it has a power over your reality? Yeah, like it has some power in my reality. 
Sweet. not necessarily yeah, over my reality, but in like it can come into my reality. Okay. Well, it's very beautiful once you see, and it's not always easy, admittedly, but when elements of that world do enter your reality, so to speak, it appears to enter your reality and it appears maybe even to threaten your desired reality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you can't see it powerfully as just because I can see that reality, let's call that the matrix for now, just because I can see the matrix reality with my physical senses even, maybe even in your own house, still does not mean it's your reality. Right. The only thing that's your reality is what you decide, what you know, what you determine, what you say is your reality. So okay. you could be having an intense dialogue, even a threatening dialogue with somebody of the matrix uh, government or some kind of agency or somebody's ready to jab you with something. <laughs> and still in that moment, in that moment, if internally you don't take any of that, you don't give it any meaning, you don't agree with that, you're staying true to what you have determined is your reality. It cannot enter your reality. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly, that's where my wobble is. Cause I feel it when you yeah. say that, like, I, like, I, I believe that, but, but now you got to know it. Now I got to know it. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm, it's not always easy. You know, I, occasionally I still have a wobble as well, but you just recognize it. And then you remind yourself of what's true and how this thing really works. And then you just get stronger and stronger in that. And that's what I'm saying. I'm advocating for the spiritual community to be strong, not to be weak, to not equate loving kindness with weakness, mm -hmm. to equate loving kindness with strength, to bring a strength to our surrender, to our softness, to our devotion. Because otherwise, yeah, I mean, what is present is going to be overwhelming to our frequency if we don't stay strong in our frequency. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for your question. That answers my question. Nice. Munira? Hi, Ben. Hey. You touched on the answer of my question uh, with Allison, but maybe... Um, Maybe I'll ask it anyway, because I, I don't feel like it's complete. Um, what if, what if the, the, the act that inspires me or is, I believe is of service and I believe it excites me, uh, has um, dangers according to the laws or like threatening and dangerous or will, uh, somehow there is a chance of jail time or some kind of accusing because of where I'm from blasphemy. And that's like very um, serious. It's not something if we, we don't have the same freedom uh, as you guys do. So <clears throat> I, I don't fear ridicule or social anything that doesn't scare me. Yeah. Somehow, sometimes that bring that makes me question. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I get your question. Sweet. You just have to be really clear on who it is that you are, what your destiny entails, as much as you can intuitively, and ask yourself what the what the path is through which you can be most of service. Now, I've had several strong occasions in my life, like quote unquote real choice points where I could take different routes. And if I had taken those different routes, I would not be speaking to you here today. I can tell you that. So I would have lived a very different life past a certain point. And I was close. I was at one, well, at two occasions, at least, I was very close to choosing that way of being of service. And uh, 
The only reason I chose this way is because after deep introspection, I felt this was the wiser approach and I could be of service for longer for more people and in the long term bring about more harmonious results than had I chosen the more short term routes, which were closer to the concept of martyrdom. So it depends, but I was close. I was close to choosing those routes. And, um, but I just felt like, mm, this has been done before. There's been martyrs before. And I connected very closely to certain entities from the past, including Jesus, that have taken that route at a certain point in their desire to be of service. And I learned a lot from them. It was almost like I, I reached a chapter in the book, in a book that a lot of service to others oriented wanderers that in a sense, take a more prominent position or a more public position or role. And it was kind of like I could vibrationally read the book of their lives and learn from at what stage they stopped being able to be physically of service to others because they chose the martyrdom vibration or route, which in the law of one terminology would be in a way an imbalance towards love, not fully balanced with wisdom. So there's something to say for both because you can make a big difference by choosing the fearless route, no matter the risk that is involved. In general, however, I would recommend you do it with some smartness. You do it <laughs> with some wisdom involved because sustainability of being of service to others is a key factor to consider. And if you take those more radical extreme routes, the most immediate routes, they're not always the most sustainable. Now they could start a little revolution and they could give a powerful message in that moment to those who are watching then. And it could plant a seed. So definitely it has a powerful effect, but you got to check in with your own soul's journey and intentions, so to speak, to see if that's the most beneficial route for you. And again, to stand strong in our frequency doesn't necessarily mean we have to be foolish and go out there and, uh, and charge the government buildings. You know what I'm saying? Just uh, as an analogy, doesn't mean we have to reform other people. It does mean we got to stay strong in our frequency. And if that guides us to go elsewhere, where our service can be more sustainable, can be more powerful long term, then generally, I would recommend that. But it is a very individual choice to make at the end of the day. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so it's it's nothing major like uh, you just you the examples you gave it's more like there are because of the religious culture there are people very opposed to uh, anyone um, directing others to their own sense of freedom it's just right. as simple as, as as that something as simple as that and i've seen people uh, what happened to other people who went in a way that was actually it turned out that they couldn't sustain their, their service to others. And I get that. And that's why I want to see when is it actually fear that <clears throat> I should step up my game and when is it actually danger and uh, harms the mission and my sustainability, like the, the yes. balance in that. Yeah. That is the question to sit with. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's such, a, that's such an individual choice that I hesitate to say more or to give direction because it's really up to you how you write that chapter of your book. And it's a beautiful opportunity and beautiful choice point intersection where you can see, oh, there's these different parallel timelines I can choose now. Um, and I wouldn't want to take that process away from you because I know from experience how beneficial going through those considerations is, how powerful that can be. Like for me, that has always been a key consideration of those choice points. They've given me a reflection, like, would you be willing to make this ultimate sacrifice? And to arrive at a place where you can say, yes, I would. Then the following consideration is, 
It doesn't mean you have to do it. But it's very cool to get to a point where you would. And in all these cases, I, I did that. I didn't just choose not to go those routes. I first completely accepted the probable consequences of taking those options. I imagined them, felt what they would. It's almost like they imagined me, like they couldn't let me go. It's very daunting almost, like boom, like a parallel reality enters your consciousness. And they would just like, almost like PTSD, like precognitive PTSD. It would just come up. It would just like overtake me and put me in those positions in my imagination, like jail time, courtroom, be, being killed, living in exile as isolation, see, hidden from the world and so forth. And until I was able to fully accept that, yes, I would be willing to go that route. And then so far, I have chosen for the most part to not take those routes because from that acceptance then arose a higher vision. And the only reason why I would have taken those paths is if I would have still been identified with those paths is one way of saying it. Now, this is really subtle. I'm not doing it justice just yet. It's a bigger topic, but there is some selfishness still in taking the martyrdom route. There is a passion that overwhelms that isn't fully balanced or controlled yet that can take over the devotion and that can blind us from the wisdom that's available that would otherwise allow us to serve more in greater quantity, greater capacity, greater quality, and more sustainably for a longer period of time. So comparing those as objectively as you can, you will feel that unless it's really relevant for your personal journey, for the most part, I would generally recommend taking the sustainable route. But not, that's not an absolute. It's not always the highest option. So it really is something that you have to tune into on an individual basis. I, yeah, I can feel what you just said. The subtle nuance. It's, yep. it's about me being that person as opposed to actually being in certain, sometimes it could be that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Jake? Hi, Bentinho. Hey. Long time no see. Yeah, I like your longer hair. It's cute. Oh, thank you. Um, your original question, um, do you want to go back to responses to that? Because this we've kind what of went in the direction, and I don't want to do that if that doesn't feel like what you want to do. What was the original question? It felt like you were asking for... For me, it landed like visceral responses, um, how yeah. what you talked about, about trust and that responsibility law and those things, how that landed. Yeah, no, for sure. Go ahead. It's very much in line. Okay. Um, wow. Um, well, viscerally, it landed like a pummeling, um, like punches to the gut. Um, Good. Slap. Good um, it hurt um, a lot. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I get, yeah. I get how you mean that, brother. Um, yeah. I always have been clear on this. I think you're clear on that. I mean, there's, it's clean. Um, But I think you know about how and why this conversation landed in the way that it did. Sure. Um, and the disappointment is always greatest here, not from there, but here. And that responsibility gap, it's like, shit, I can feel that for almost my whole life. I was telling Allie this morning, it's like, I've been retired since I was nine. And that was the word <laughs> that came. Like I've been retired since I was nine of mm. not stepping into, not stepping up, but just watching life like a Netflix show. Or while you were talking, it came to mind again from Yellowstone. It's like, not that it's contemplated seriously, but like, not wanting to commit suicide because you're just addicted to life 
like a TV show. There's no commitment there. There's no involvement there. There's no, <clears throat> like, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So in a sense, it landed like nothing's ever landed, not just from you, but from anybody. Um, like, what the fuck? You know, what are you doing? Um, so yes, there was disappointment. There was deep embarrassment, not like the embarrassment from out there, but embarrassment. Um, not, and again, not a negative embarrassment, just like being laid naked, you know, standing naked. Um, yeah. That's the fire I was talking about, the effect of the fire of the sun, right? That's why it's not always pleasant. <laughs> it's not meant to be. I mean, it's like pleasant isn't, there's nothing in pleasant. There, there's no juice in pleasant. Yeah. But um, that's that's how it landed. And then, yeah. And then there's the little voice that says, okay, so yeah, you got his transmission. Yeah, what's going to change? Um, so like that. And uh, I hesitated to raise the hand because in a sense, it can be just more of the same old bullshit that seems to come out of this one. But I, and I, I didn't want it to be that. That's why I checked in at the beginning to see if you wanted to still go in that direction. So if you have anything to speak to that further, otherwise I'll I'll just go. Cool. Although I think the seed has been planted. I don't think I have to say much right now. I think you got this and it's uh, good that it emerged for you or unveiled itself. Yeah, it's that fine balance again, or, or not so much about, I don't like the word balance because it's almost like, oh, you can't go too far left. You can't go too far right. And it inhibits your passion. So balance is a word to be somewhat careful with how we apply it, but it's more a simultaneity. It's the simultaneity of when that awareness of ourselves increases and we become more aware of the gremlin's operational mechanism, in your case, resignation at the age of nine, then yes, it's quite automatic that there is some sense of uh, contrast or um, which can translate as embarrassment or um, seeing one's own lack of integrity or lack of fulfilled potential or fear, having catered to fear in some ways and justified it in some ways. And so that's great. Just make sure simultaneous to that, you have a very accepting awareness of it, yet without losing the passion to see it through into a more courageous integration of the whole. Does that make sense? I'll repeat this. So as the stuff comes up that's confronting and that maybe you're inclined to judge yourself for. Make sure that simultaneous to that, you have an accepting, resting and awareness approach so that you don't indulge in the labels such as embarrassment, or I did something wrong, or I didn't do enough, or those labels you want to, you want to rest back into loving acceptance by resting in awareness, resting in the nature of mind, resting in being, resting in God, as you start to see those contrasting insights about, oh, shit, I've consolidated myself in this particular way to stay safe or comfortable or whatever. And now seeing it, seeing that it's not fully aligned, you're actually responding to love responsibility. So it's a good thing. Like you said, it's not in a negative way. But so at the same time, be aware of any negative self judgment, which is not helpful, but not to the extent or not in a way where you go back into complacency either. That's the simultaneity here of completely accepting awareness, which at the same time, at the heart of itself has an intention to be a courageous, free, true being. Just even for your own alignment to begin with, for your own energy flow to begin with, to clear out those fears, to do that with a combination, simultaneity of loving awareness and a deliberateness or a desire to be fully free. Because when we choose fears and when we resign, it's out of fear. It's not out of true wisdom. It's not out of true love for God. It's out of fear most of the time. So that balance or that simultaneity of purely loving, accepting awareness, not falling for the negative self-judging labels, because that kind of like re-solidifies or reacts to the patterns that are being unveiled. And yes, then you create more reactionary energy. 
So allow it to come up. And it's fine if initially there is that label. Well, what does this feel like? It kind of feels like embarrassment. That's fine. The first sort of registering of what it is, giving it a bit of a name, a bit of a context, that's fine. But then quite immediately, uh, as you identify what it is, you relax the labels and you allow that energy to blend back into this loving space of awareness. You forgive yourself. And yet, if you're doing that truly, you will find that the fire or the passion for truthful living, for free living, is not diminished at all. So it's not the complacent route of accepting yourself. It's the fiery, passionate, blazing light route of accepting whatever comes up that then purifies and aligns you and makes you courageous and makes you feel good about yourself where prior you felt a little embarrassed or weakened. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Um, Wonderful. I mean, look a second. Yes, it, yeah, there's, there's been a chunk of molten lava that has come up and spews and come up, but there's this last chunk that needs to come out and then the sun will be all that's left. And then my mission, my destiny can then be accomplished. Um, so I think this is. Yep. As long as you accept yourself throughout the process. And forgive the suppression or repression that you've chosen or the resignation. If you just accept it and forgive it, then absolutely it will result in that freedom, that purity, that truth. Yes. Thank you, Bentinho. Thanks, Jake. Bye. Sabine. And let's not raise any new hands. So we have uh, three mini sessions left here just in the interest of time and energy. Go ahead, Sabine. Um, yeah, I had a similar reaction to and Jake. Um, I just feel sick to my stomach and feel like you slapped me in the face. Yeah, literally, I feel like vomiting. <laughs> Do that later. Can be um, a good thing. Yeah, it's I just oh, embarrassment. Everything came up. Um, you know, when you said you reject the call of millions, if you're not courageous, it's just so, you know, especially with with having in mind, you know, becoming a bodhisattva, being a bodhisattva, enlightenment for the benefit of all beings and, you know, being of service. And then the few things on the path where it feels like I'm doing the right thing, but then later it's just like, no, it's like, that was based on fear. And that was like when, you know, when your trailer came out and Roger said, let's put it, you know, on our page. <laughs> let's tell everybody our 40,000 subscribers. And I just said, no, it's like, like, no. And it felt like almost like intuition or I labeled it that way. I thought it's like, no, it's like if people Google him, it's, it's a total shit show. Um, <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> But Roger was so convinced, Roger, like, and I, and I thought it was so beautiful, but I just, it's like, and I know every teacher we covered, people complained about, but this is more personal, I feel, because you're like, my teacher, <laughs> it's like, um, so if people say something there, but yeah, I cannot totally see now after all this talk, it was totally just me being fearful and had nothing to do with the people not being ready <laughs> for your teachings. Um, and so embarrassing because the weekend was epic. It was so good and it benefited so many people that, you know, we we sent there like my best friend is in the most beautiful state he's ever been in his life. And um, more people could have benefited from that. But anyways, I just, I don't know what I'm doing here on this. <laughs> Pouring my heart out. So this is a very good session, and um... <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's your conclusion after all these feelings. So this is a very good session. <laughs> yeah, because it comes up. It's like whoa, exactly. you know. It's yes. like digging really deep. Yeah. So <laughs> what this addresses for me is just um, I haven't really ever addressed this. I don't think, but it's a cool little subtopic that plays into how I started the session about the collective trends and so forth. Like one of the things that I've seen consistently is that people that benefit from my work are afraid to 
speak out for me. And I'm not going to at all make this about that in terms of, I don't want anybody to go out there and like claim, you know, anything on my behalf or fight for me or anything like that. That's not the intention. But as a trend that I've observed, that I'm sure applies to a lot of fields and, and a lot of people and sub-communities out there, which does speak accurately and powerfully to the point of we do have to, at some point, own what we believe resonates for us and or what we know resonates for us, regardless of belief systems. And if we don't own that, it's going to take a longer time to create the planet that we want to. So I've noticed a lot that like people I've collaborate with, collaborated with or that were so excited about my work and, um, and our collaborations, they would just be nowhere to be seen after some article came out. Like they would chicken out. So what that does, and I'm speaking about this because I want you guys to recognize the trends generally. It's not about me. But what you're doing is we're all standing up as a group. Then there is some pushback and everyone sits down except for me. So what does that do? Not just to my personal life, which is my thing to deal with, but what does that do to the mission? If everyone stands up for something, and then one of the people in that group, because they're more public or they're easier to attack, gets attacked, if the whole army, so to speak, steps down, you make a target out of the mission that you stood strong and that you were a part of before that. So there is some, in my humble opinion, there is some loss of integrity in that regard. I'm not saying that you should have shared this because maybe it was intuition. That is entirely up to you. It could be, it could have been the right thing because there is a timing to this thing. And I know that at some point, the work that we do here and that I have been doing, I know, I know it will be validated. The people will understand, or at least it will be acknowledged um, for the clarity that it brings to people's lives. But I have seen a lot of people, um, supporters and people that have benefited from that come to many retreats or even collaborators and like co-teachers just like, you know, either take the content off or, you know, suddenly not be associated with me. Um, and again, it's not about me, but if I represent that, which makes something deep within come alive for people, then now it's not about me anymore. It's about what that alive principle is. I'm just one symbol of it. I'm just one expression of it. But you are an equal expression of that. It's just that maybe I ignited it. I made it verbal for you. I made it recognizable and therefore it awoke in you, but it was already there. That's why I call it the ignition of global awakening. Or we, we decided as a team um, with Richard Condon's um, suggestion actually of this term, as he guided our team through this process he does. And we landed on the ignition of global awakening. We were thinking, okay, global awakening, but what awakening the world, like that all feels like a verb, like we're doing it. But no, it people, everyone's already an agent of the mission. Every single individual, including the haters and the ridiculers and the bloggers and the media, they want this. The very people that are writing shit about me want this. They're still the people I'm serving, even after they accuse or blame or ridicule. So that doesn't change for me. But so every individual already has this. We're just here to ignite it. But again, the meekness and the fear in the spiritual community, to me, is something to be addressed with love, with self-compassion and forgiveness. But we have to realize that every time we back down, we make a target out of the mission by, oh yeah, okay, that's just his ideas. Somehow no longer is it yours because you don't want to be associated with it. Now it's, uh, it's just Bentinho's character. And I'm easy, for, my head can be chopped off. It's easy to do. So, and then what? Like, I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, you guys will do your own thing and, and, and raise the frequency of the planet. I'm not concerned about that at all. But again, if we all stand up, not for me per se, although that can be an extension of it in certain occurrences when it is relevant to stand for something and give a counter voice. But instead of all sitting back down and painting a target on the back of the mission, in this case, my persona or my physical life, then that is an example. It's just an example of the type of behavior that comes from fear. And it's not being constituted as bodhisattva. It's not being constituted as living our calling. 
And so I love that you're bringing this up so fearlessly. It's a great step in that direction. And the thing is, Sabine, the more people stand up for this, not against anything, just stand up for what's alive in you, not even me, but what's alive in you. And if that's associated with me, let it be associated with me and let your ego be annihilated in that process to the best of your ability. It's okay if you falter, but let that be the intention more clearly. Because the more people do this, the less there is a target on any of our backs. And therefore, the less the mission can be undermined. And this is what I meant with most revolutions that had a lot of potential for the benefit of all that failed is because it was one individual that was singled out and the people were following instead of co-creating. And then when it came down to it, ooh, oh, the leader is killed. Oh, okay. Mm -mm. What was I doing before this again? So we got to be constituted individually as the mission. And therefore, I keep saying, I want you, I say this to my team sometimes, I want each and every one of you to be sourced by the same thing that sources me. So I don't want, I'm not your employer. I'm not the CEO of this organization and you're an employee. I am a servant of the mission, as are you. So the CEO is the mission, it's not me. I work for the mission. I just work very completely for the mission. And so often people come and they like put me into a particular picture and they start maybe taking their cues from me, which in a leadership position has some relevance. However, there is a more important element here, which is every individual needs to be constituted. If you look at all the revolutionary companies, even just in like, let's say Apple, those people need to be constituted. They need to believe in the mission, not in Steve Jobs. It can be inspiring to believe in Steve Jobs, but why is Steve Jobs inspiring to them? It's because of how constituted he was in the vision when nothing there was no evidence for it. That's inspiring. It evokes the same courage in us. But that courage does not belong to Steve Jobs. It belongs to God. And if then we step back down, when we get some heat, then we paint a target on the leader that we love and that has inspired that. And I think on an individual level, it lacks some integrity. It sacrifices some alignment there. So it is something to consider. It's a subtle phenomenon, but I'm happy that you addressed it. And um, it's beautiful. Thank you, too. And again, there is a wisdom and a timing to it. So I'm not concerned. I know that the work that we do here will find more roots and it will, it will be validated. The proof is in the pudding. And my recent post on Instagram came from that realization or frequency is that people seek what they now ridicule. And so one day the whole world will turn to that which they currently ridicule. And we're here to prepare the grounds to receive them all. So we got to stay steadfast in the mission, not be as distracted by the human dynamics and the reactions of the old. Always remember that those who ridicule you want what you have. It's the spiritual jealousy I was talking about in the weekend retreat. Thank you very much, Sabine. Appreciate the honesty. Ben? Hey, I, I just initially rose my hand because I just wanted to express a lot of gratitude and that's kind of it, honestly. Um, like recently I've been kind of just feeling like almost like a, a purposelessness and like a lack of like, yeah, orientation towards the mission and the session just like lit that fire underneath me. Mm -hmm. and gave me like the question and like perspective to dive into and really anchor in like see what comes up to that um yeah that was it that was really it it's like a lot of like when i rose my hand it was just like a lot of stuff coming to me because like a lot of i've just experienced a lot of like darkness shadow suffering a lot of when i look back at all of those moments it's all rooted in like a lack of trust or like the external world, it's not a helicopter. Um, it, it all just seemed like it was rooted in like lack of trust, like a lack of um, love, 
or like yeah yeah lack of trust for the external world like a lot of fear and then which ultimately is like a lack of trust in myself like it must be and i feel like this um everything that you just expressed is like the tools to become trustworthy in yourself and like i feel like that's just going to bring me a lot of peace and like a lot of freedom beautiful yeah thank you um Yes, and to kind of sort of blend between what you're sharing and what I was just sharing with Sabine. Equate this to equate this to relationships. All right. So if you're not strong in your vibration in what you trust and what you stand for, then your partner cannot surrender to you, cannot trust you. Does that make sense? Similarly, there's billions of people that are calling for the most part unconsciously they don't know exactly what they're looking for but they're seeking and they're struggling and they're suffering to find it so when if we don't stay strong if we don't own that reality at the expense of our memory of the matrix as it was if we don't fully step into this vibrational reality with complete trust if we're not then stable if we're not trusting them, we're also not trustworthy. But if enough people are trustworthy because they are stable, because they say, no, this is real, this way of being is real, and it does provide solutions, if we stay strong in that, now those who seek a relationship to what we are representatives of are able to surrender to that. But if their ridicule can pull us down, then... It's not what they want. It's not the stability they seek. It's not the divinity they seek. It's not the new way of being that they seek. But if we stay strong in the face of their ridicule, now they, in time, will be able to surrender to what is offered because we claim it's a real thing. If we don't ever claim it's real for us, that it's really our lived experience, if we don't trust ourselves in that and we don't trust the mission and we don't trust God and we don't trust this way of being that we've awakened within ourselves, then how can anybody else rely or trust enough to let go of their world when they're less spiritually trained and privileged if they don't have this solid example for something living, something real, something alive to begin to step into? It doesn't directly answer your thing, but it's related to the trust thing. Do you have a question or you just want to share that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to share the gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really have much else. Thank you. Thanks, man. I love your uh, antennae. They're beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Nice hair. I didn't really know what you meant by antennae. I was like, but okay. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there, this group of Native Americans that kind of more or less had a military function or scouting function. <laughs> And um, when they uh, when they took away their long hairs, they were a less able to perform their uh, scouting and intuitive hunting duties and so forth. Ra also calls it antennae. No, it's no problem if you have uh, short hair, by the way. You're used to it. But they were used to having long hair, and they used that as an amplification uh, device, as antennae for their uh, sensing the environment and stuff. Because it's such a subtle material, and it's so plentiful it picks up on a lot of subtle static vibrations. So hence the word antennae. Thomas? Hello. Hello. So, hi. Uh, there was a, um, a moment during uh, your talk today where I, like, I really felt this sense of like, whoa, like this is possible. And that felt like a very, um, like a kind of a bit of a breakthrough, like uh, in terms of like vibration or just of like mm -hmm. sensing what is possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Beautiful. So maybe I just wanted to, to kind of that's share perfect. that, that sense. Yeah. Love of like, this is actually like a real that's, thing. That's right. But you see, that's exactly the same phenomenon that, that we need to be able to demonstrate to those who are much more skeptical than you are. So like 
this is an example of the trust and the stability and the realness that I don't waver from. It's transmitting to you that it's really something real that we can step into. It's a real possibility. But if everyone backs down when it's ridiculed or undermined or just these other agendas that try to stop this, and if we all sort of cater to that because our fear of social ridicule, then who's going to ever believe that this is a real possibility if we don't make it real, if we don't live in that reality? But if it's real for us and it's real for enough people with enough consistency for constituted in the reality we know is possible, now it is a real thing. Now we are it and therefore we're manifesting it and making it easier for those who are less trained or less privileged, so to speak, to have an easier time to make that shift because they see it's real. So beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah, it felt like just in terms of the whole spiritual community, like if that belief is like fairly like foundational, like, no, like this is totally possible. And like, it becomes like, um, just so like constituted, like within yes. themselves. then I think that, that that's just super powerful because it doesn't seem totally. like a, a fantasy. It's just like, no, this is totally Awesome. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. We're all we're all God, as well as we have a human component, a human counterpart. And on neither am I any different from you. As God, obviously, I'm not different from you. And as a human, I'm not different from you. So whatever constitution you perceive in me that might be inspiring or or evoke something in you, just understand that I come from no other background than you do. It's just God plus the human, the human component. That's all you need to be constituted in God's love and a surrender and devotion to the greater good of all with as little bias and personal ideas as are possible. It's just an energy of surrender and then let spirit or consciousness, your blueprint, guide your movements. And that degree of surrender that you might perceive in me that might inspire you doesn't come from any other plays than the choices I've made in my life with the human component there. So there's nothing different about me. Do you understand that? I'm not a special case. I'm just rare, but not special. There's a difference. <laughs> rare means it isn't out there in a whole lot of quantity. That doesn't mean it's special, just means it's rare. So it's accessible. God is accessible. Devotion is accessible. Service to others is accessible. And it's totally fine to have your personal fears and beliefs and ideas and uh, you just apply the work diligently. I didn't become as streamlined as I am today overnight. I've had to go through lots of different explorations and I wanted to, I wanted to really taste the life of what it's like to be human in all its facets. So I've, um, I've lived through a lot of different things for my age and that's given me ground to teach to more different kinds of mindsets and so forth. But the essence, other than that, perhaps, other than my lifestyle being quite varied and, and high octane since an early age, there isn't anything much different from your own lives. And uh, it's the intention that matters. Everything is possible. And this is not special. Capish. That means also there's no excuse. Because often if people project something onto me, like some special status or a special incarnation, then that gives them the right to Netflix. <laughs> oh, this guy just came here as a teacher, which is true. I did come here with that intention, but so did you guys. So it doesn't give you the <laughs> right to Netflix the results of my intentions. You understand? I mean, to a degree, that's how you, that's how you start. That's how you get it acquainted with it, but once it evokes a true quality of just inwardly knowing, it's just this knowing that cannot be described, that I know most of you guys are feeling right now on some level. That's all you need. That's been my guidepost. 
that's been my guidepost. My human life has been just as scattered and confusing as yours might be. But it's that acting true to that inner knowing over and over and over again, that's what purifies the human component that makes it a clearer, more intelligent, more free-flowing vessel for the God component. And this is in all of you right now. That's what's listening to my voice. Nobody's special. It's all a matter of intention and willingness. That's why um, I recommend courage. My love is with you always, and I thank you for being here. See you most likely next Wednesday.